Hello everyone, this is Dr. Pruitt. Welcome to this week's EKG. This week we have a 69 year old male who calls EMS because he's feeling weak and dizzy and he almost fainted. He's been taking antibiotics for the last week and he's been feeling really nauseated and vomited several times over the last couple of days. When you get his vital signs, this is what you see. You see a heart rate of 41, a little slow, that would make me weak and dizzy. Uh, blood pressure is 110 over 69, that's okay. Oxygen is 94% on room air, sounds like his airway is intact and he's breathing effectively, don't need to address anything there. Sugar is 117 and his temp is 98. So, so far the only concerning vital sign is our bradycardia. Um, go ahead and get a 12 lead. Anytime you have an elderly patient that's feeling a little weak and dizzy, uh, their chest pain or cardiac things don't always present typically. So go ahead and get a 12 lead. Uh, see what you can find. Maybe that's contributing to how they're feeling. And so this is what you see. I'll give you a second to take a look at it, come up with your own diagnosis, and then we'll talk through it together. So we start with the rate. We noticed earlier his heart rate was 41. This is what the computer is telling us as well. I'm just going to check uh, with my eyes here and see if it lines up with, uh, if I agree with what the computer is telling me. And oh my goodness, it does look slow. Um, I'm going to start here. This one lines up with this QRS, lines up with a thick red line. So we're going to count down 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50. We're somewhere around 40. So it is slow. I concur with the computer. Um, and to the naked eye, it also looks slow. So we have a bradycardic rhythm at 41. Moving on to our next tool in our evaluation is our rhythm. Is it regular or irregular? Especially with bradycardic rhythms, you really want to pay close attention. Think about blocks. Where are your P waves? Are they marching out? Are they the same distance every time? So this does look very regular to me. Um, I don't see any irregularities, any dropped beats, anything that catches my eye. And then we move on to P waves. Like I said, bradycardic rhythms, you're concerned about blocks. Are they actually being conducted? And so I'm looking for two things here. I'm looking for a P wave before every QRS. And this one is a little bit difficult. I picked it on purpose because not every 12 lead in the field is going to be perfect. Sometimes we get artifact and you can't help it. But we just do the best with what we've got. I think I can see a P wave right here in lead two. Hard to tell, so I'm going to move on and see if they march out. These are all the same point in time, and I do see a P wave here. So that looks like it works good. Here's a P wave before this one. Um, I see a P wave here. They seem to be the same distance between the QRSs. Here's another P wave. Here's another P wave. Here's another P wave. So I would call this a sinus bradycardia. The other thing though, when you're looking for P waves, make sure you don't see any in between your QRS complexes that maybe are dropped beats and are not conducted. And so again, it's very difficult to tell uh, with all of this artifact here. This kind of catches my eye, but I'm not really gonna anchor on that too much unless I see something else that makes me concerned. And I don't see anything that looks like aberrant P waves or unconducted beats in between these QRS complexes. So I'm pretty confident just calling this a regular sinus bradycardia. Uh, as we move on to our axis, remember we look at leads one and leads AVF. We're mostly up in lead one and we're mostly up in AVF. That gives us two thumbs up. Our left thumb is lead one, our right thumb is AVF. Two thumbs up, our axis is good. Um, how are our intervals? We're looking at our QRS, 98. They look narrow to me, uh, less than 120, that's good. And then our QTC, which is corrected for rate, is 507. And if you remember, um, 450 is kind of where you're at risk for long QT, technically long QT, but over 500 is where you're at risk for spontaneous arrhythmia. And this one is 507. Very important to note. And if you look at it, it does look kind of long and slurry and drawn out. The distance between the Q wave and the end of the T wave is pretty long. So we have a long QT at 507, and then we move on to our ST segments. So we're looking for any ST elevation above the baseline. I start with 2, 3 AVF in our inferior leads. Those look like no inverted T waves, no ST elevation there in the inferior leads. I move to my high lateral. 
Um, again, no ST elevation or T-wave inversion there. Septal leads also look good. Anterior leads, same thing. Maybe a little bit here, but it's only one box and there's no reciprocal changes, so I'm not going to make a big deal out of that. So I'll, I'll call those normal. So at the end of the day, what we're left with for our interpretation is we have a sinus bradycardia with a rate of 41, a normal axis, a long QT, and no ischemic changes on our ST segments. And so when we're thinking about long QT, there's several things that cause it. There's actually three kind of categories I think about are the big ones that we'll encounter mostly in EMS. One is electrolytes. So if you have someone with low potassium or magnesium, potassium is the big one, and this is really driven by diet. If you have someone who's chronically malnourished, maybe an elderly patient in a nursing home, or maybe somebody who's been vomiting a lot for the last several days and not able to keep anything down, or a chronic alcoholic who only drinks alcohol and doesn't really have a very good diet, super high risk for malnutrition, super high risk for low potassium, and low potassium will definitely stretch out your QT interval. The other thing I think about is the antis. This is a whole class of medications. Easy to remember, antibiotics, azithromycin is very famous for this, uh, antiemetics. And this is where you need to take note because if you have someone who's um, got a long QT on their 12 lead, you gotta be really careful about giving them Zofran because this will make it even worse. And so this is a gentleman, even though he's nauseated and maybe vomiting, I would probably not give him Zofran. I would give him an inhaled isopropyl alcohol pad until he gets to the hospital because I don't want to make that QT any worse. He's already at risk for a spontaneous arrhythmia, and so no Zofran for him. That's really the only medication we carry in the field that can uh, make this worse, but you need to be aware of the others that underlying that patients may be taking or may be prescribed that could be prolonging their QT. So antipsychotics are also famous for this, Haldol, Droperidol, um, Zyprexa, most of the antipsychotics uh, will do this. And so ask your patients, this is why we ask what medications they're taking because it may be um, having effects on their cardiac conduction. Antiarrhythmics will do the same thing, amiodarone, um, different, different heart medications. So if it's an antiarrhythmic medication, be aware that it could prolong their QT. And again, this is not anything we'll give, but just know that it can uh, make this happen. And then the hypos, hypothermia, hypothyroid, and I call this hypo rate, <laughs> bradycardia, it just fits with the hypos. And so that's what this patient has. He's bradycardic and as things slow down, they just tend to stretch out a little bit more. And he's, this is in the setting of his recent antibiotic use and in the setting of his recent several days of vomiting and so he's got a lot of these risk factors that are probably prolonging his QT. Um, but realize your, your hypothermic patients that are getting bradycardic or are very, very cold, they will um, also have that long QT. So these are some of the things that can cause it. Um, these are our patient populations that are most at risk. So when you identify this, cue in on this and think about getting a 12 lead before you give them Zofran. One of the drugs that's most famous for prolonging the QT is methadone. And so if you have someone who's addicted to narcotics and they're taking methadone to help with their uh, narcotic addiction, uh, get a 12 lead before you give them Zofran because they will probably have a long QT. Uh, alcoholics, I mentioned before, typically if they're severe alcoholics, they'll be malnourished. They t can have low potassium levels, can also prolong their QT. Psychiatric patients with their antipsychotic uh, anti medications can do this. Chronic vomiting, as we see more uh, cyclic vomiting syndrome or marijuana use with cannabis uh, hyperemesis syndrome, you may see longer QT in some of our younger patients with their abdominal pain and their vomiting. And then the history of heart disease if they're on antiarrhythmic. So these are the patients where you really need to cue in on that QT, make sure you're treating them correctly, and be ready with your magnesium if you need to, if it's over 500. Though if they develop spontaneous torsades, we treat that with magnesium. So have that in the back of your mind and know your doses and be ready. And that's all for today.